as we come to the end of the year and we're approaching a new one, I don't know if you're like me, but I start thinking about what lies ahead. And I'm convinced of the fact that as we approach this, most of us want to be better next year than what we were at things this year. Better relationally, better financially, better physically, spiritually. Now, of those areas that I've just mentioned, how many of you would want to be better next year? Come on, hands up. I'm sure my hand will also go up at least for one of those. Now, as we conclude this year, you know, the, the question is, how do you finish uh, this statement that I'm about to make? Next year, I hope to. Okay, come on, just think about that for a moment. Next year, I hope to. I hope to have a stronger marriage or pay off my student debt, overcome an addiction, to be physically healthier, perhaps to start serving a church or to be stronger spiritually. You know, the reality is, is that most of us want to be better. And rarely have I ever met someone that, uh, that had this goal or this intention to be worse at something. You know, next year I hope to gain 40 extra and unnecessary pounds to, you know, to raise my blood pressure uh, to dangerous levels and to put myself at risk. Or perhaps, you know, uh, next year I hope to blow my emergency fund or get an extra 20 pounds or 30,000 pounds worth of debt. I've never met somebody that said next year, you know, my marriage has been so good this year that next year I hope it gets decimated. We all want things to be better. Um, but here's the reality. Today I want to speak to you about hope. How do we put our hope into action? This is the first a message in our Christmas series, Let the Bells Ring. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be chatting about a small little happenings in the Christmas story that perhaps you and I can relate to, things that touch our lives and that also position our compass for next year lying ahead. And so today, I want to focus on the issue of hope. In the first letter to, uh, that Peter writes, um, in chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, he writes these words. He says, prepare your hearts and minds for action love that. There's something that he wants to activate in our lives. And then he says, stay alert. Fix your hope firmly on the marvelous grace that is coming to you. For when Jesus Christ is unveiled, and he's not talking about a future reality, he's speaking about Christ being revealed in our lives now. He says, a greater measure of grace will be released to you. As God's obedient children, never again shape your lives by the desires that you followed when you didn't know better. Instead, shape your lives to become like the Holy One who has called you. You see, sometimes in our faith, and I think this is where we get confused, we look to God to make our lives better, you know, a better life. In 2022, I want to do better at this, better at that, better. But, but Jesus didn't come to give us a better life. He came to give us a better way, a better hope. And when I speak about the concept of hope, I, I want to go back to what Peter writes about this. He says, prepare your hearts and minds for action. Because I believe that hope isn't just something that we carry around internally. He says, I want you to stay alert and fix your hope firmly on the marvelous grace that is coming to you, that is being revealed to you. Prepare yourselves for action because I believe hope is such a strong part of our lives. And the Christmas story embeds hope so strong in our thinking and in our lives that it actually calls out for action. It's time to put your hope into action. God is not interested in just giving you a better way, not a better life. You know, we sometimes propose this. God wants to put hope into action action in your life. And so for today's message, I want to go to the story of Joseph, the father of Jesus. 
Because I believe that the first thing that you and I need to do if we wanted to put our hope into action is to clearly define the challenge. Make sure what you think is the challenge is really the challenge. Now, just think about Joseph for a moment. You know, he was betrothed to be married to Mary. Excited, expectant for the future. You know, he probably had a house lined up, the, the, the wedding feast, everything that, that, that happens when you start planning a marriage. Now, when the Bible says he was betrothed to her, that is in Jewish culture that is as good as being married, except for the fact they, that they weren't intimate. And, and we're going to pick up our story in Matthew chapter 1 from verse 18 onwards. Um, because I want to look at three ways or three things that happened in Joseph's life right here in Matthew chapter 1 that put his hope into action. So the Bible says this is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. His mother, Mary, had promised Joseph to be his wife. But while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. And right here, that's where we have the tension point. Right here, we have the problem. Because her fiancé, Joseph, was a righteous man, full of integrity. And he didn't want to disgrace her. But when he learned of her pregnancy, he secretly planned to break the engagement. And while he was still debating with himself about what to do, he fell asleep and had a supernatural dream. You know, of all the tricky situations that you can get yourself in in life, um, if I think about Joseph and Mary in this moment, what a mess. You know, in this moment, Joseph didn't just hope things would get better. He actually started defining the problem for himself. He started dreaming, you know, about the life of love and, and children and, and a wife and settling down and and now, suddenly, someone needs to end this moment of disgrace. You and I have moments like that. Um, we might not be in the same situation as Joseph, but we have moments where we are totally confused. Things happen around us. There's no definition. We're unsure about what needs to happen. You know, as you're listening to this message, you might admit to yourself, you know, the, the thing is, I, I, you know, about generosity or my spiritual life is not where it should be. Perhaps you've never thought, uh, you know, a substance could control your life so much. Or for some of you, it's admitting that you actually need help with the struggle that you're having internally. But here's the reality. You cannot defeat what you don't define. Call it out. Make it clear. This is the problem. Because when the pain eventually becomes our normal, you see, sometimes things happen that are so painful or unstable or we've been so long, we've been rocky and, and shaken about that this becomes our normal and we don't actually realize that we are in trouble and our life is in ruins or even in disgrace. And in this moment, we need to break down the walls and recognize what is happening because when we define the problem, we often discover the biggest opportunity to exhibit God's glory. In this moment of crisis for Joseph, as a young man, you know, confused about what's happening around him, this became his biggest opportunity to exhibit the glory of God. I love the Bible, you know, saying as he was considering this, he, he fell asleep. Now, I'm not quite sure, you know, was he just like that and then fell asleep? Oh, I'm not sure, but you've heard me say before, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do in a moment of crisis is go and have a nap. Well, this is exactly what happens to Joseph. Because from this point forward, from this moment where he defines the problem, he says, listen, Mary, here's a problem. Perhaps I should divorce her in secret. From this moment on, something different happens. You see, for some of us, it's, it's necessary to turn that page. Hope, hope requires of me and you to turn that page. 
You know, sometimes it's necessary for me and you to start committing to God's word. You know, perhaps there are things in your life that you need to just leave behind or, you know, stop complaining or start looking for God's supernatural provision in a situation. Sometimes it's necessary for us to stop whinging and, and whining because no measure of complaining or thinking or whining would have brought Joseph out of this situation and delivered hope for where he found himself. You know, Joseph defined the problem. I need to divorce this girl in secret. And he decided he was going to do this until the next thing happened. And so for a lot of us, when we're putting hope into action, can I encourage you? Firstly, you need to define what the problem is. Because sometimes when we define the problem, you know, it actually helps us see clearly. But when we allow the second thing to happen, and this is what happens in Joseph's life, God's word brings perspective. The angel appears to him, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. And the angel says to him, Joseph, descendant of David. I love that because he reminds Joseph of who he truly is. He says, don't hesitate to take Mary as your wife. Because the power of the Holy Spirit has conceived a child in her womb. And she will give birth to a son. And you ought to name him Savior. For he is destined to give his life to save his people from their sins. And then, then the angel says to him, this, is, this happened to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through his prophet. This is, this is what happens in Joseph's dream. And he says, listen, a virgin will be pregnant. He reminds him of Isaiah and she will give birth to the son and, and, and his name will be Emmanuel, which means God became one of us. Let me tell you, you are going to need heaven's perspective when you have defined the problem because you must understand in this moment Joseph lost hope this hope of what what he felt in his heart you know this this woman this marriage this relationship he could see these things in this moment hope died and when he defined the problem and said all right you know I need to get out of this relationship in a moment God intervenes and heaven brings perspective. It would have been so easy for Joseph to think, you know, this is a, what a mess, and then perhaps write a detailed Facebook post complaining about the problem and then go on with his life without Mary. Let me tell you, he could have had every doubt flood into his mind that he was not qualified to do this, even as he had this dream. You know, you might be able to relate to how he feels. You, you might have thought in your life, you know, if I, if I start this, you know, what happens if I fail? Or what happens if I don't have what it takes? I'm not qualified to do this. And that's exactly why it's imperative for us to seek God and his perspectives for our lives. Because in this moment, you know, God didn't call the equipped one. He equipped those he had called. He equipped Joseph and Mary for the calling that he had placed on their lives. And, and let me tell you, without heaven's perspective, you will end up divorcing Mary and miss out on the biggest miracle that God has intended for your life. Without heaven's perspective, you will never take ownership of what God is giving you. You will always underestimate his calling on your life and you will stay stuck in the mess around you and never find hope to move forward or to get out and go through. This is putting hope into action. When you allow God's word to bring perspective, it often redefines that which we have defined as the problem. And that redefinition moves, you know, from this definition of the problem, it actually moves it to becoming one of our lives' greatest blessings. How do you put hope into action? You define the problem. But then secondly, you allow God's word to bring perspective to that situation. Without that perspective, let me tell you, you're going to lose hope again. 
So it's great. Define the problem. Recognize what is going on. But allow God's word to bring perspective. Because as that happens, hope is birthed. You know, I can just imagine Joseph waking up after that dream, recognizing this is heaven's perspective. And in that moment, he had a choice. Either I can surrender to this hope and the perspectives of God that have been revealed, or I can walk away with it and still be faced with a life without hope. But what he chooses to do in that moment, he chooses to act on his hope. Listen to what Matthew 1, 24 to 25 says, and this is fascinating for me. It says, when Joseph woke from his dream, he did all that the angel of the Lord instructed him to do. <laughs> I love that. He did everything. You know, he, he, he woke up. There was a new sense of perspective. And so he decided to do everything. He took Mary to be his wife. They refrained from being intimate with one another, says the Bible, until she gave birth to her firstborn son. And then he named him Jesus, says one of the translations. He did all the angel commanded. You know, there was an immediate and comprehensive response in Joseph's life. And what I love about this is that he and, and Mary together actually did this. God's word came to Joseph, but together they outworked this. You know, sometimes we think hope has to outwork itself in our lives on our own. But God has positioned us within community to allow hope, which he has birthed in us, to flourish. You are part of a connected family. Come on, church. You know, when, when, when we allow the hope of God to be birthed within us, when we allow heaven's perspectives to reshape the problems we face and the situations we find ourselves in, he moves us from seeing a challenge to recognizing this is the greatest opportunity for the glory of God to be revealed. You know, this is the unspoken part of this. The Bible doesn't tell us how Mary and Joseph handled the shame in their family because they still had to. You know, here was a child born out of wedlock. How did they deal with that? What were the complications? How did they communicate this to the family? It didn't take those aspects away, but it allowed that which God had birthed in them to come forth and to flourish beyond this situation. You know, when we think about hope in our lives, my name is not Joseph and, 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 and you aren't Mary. And, you know, I recognize this, but just listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter one. He says, living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within us. <laughs> I love that. I, I mean, how do you explain this? Paul couldn't explain this. It still gives me a headache. You know, how do you, how do you even think about this Christ in us? But the Bible says this mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people. And God wants everyone to know it. And I, I, I don't know what situation you're facing. I don't know what you're hoping for would be better in your life in 2022. But here's what I do know. Whether it's better or not, you and I don't just have hope. We have hope in action. We have the wisdom to define the challenge but we have heaven's perspective to guide and lead us through these moments. You and I have more than hope. We have hope resident inside of us. We have Christ living in us. You know, as I, as I was preparing this, I just felt I wanted to write down in my notes, you know, what tangible steps can you take 
to encourage you in this journey. Can you, can you join a life group? The answer to that is yes. Can you ask somebody in the congregation to mentor you? The answer to that is yes. Do you need a counselor? Yes, all of that is yeah. Do you need someone to pray with you regularly? Yes, yes, yes. But more than any one of these things, we need to recognize that heaven's perspective redefines, shows us that Christ within us brings wisdom and courage to be and to go through that which we are experiencing. Not with a sense of just may our lives be better, but to live lives of hope, to live lives where hope is encouraged and where His glory becomes exhibited through our lives. You know what, if, uh, if there was a, a church steeple with a bell in it, let me tell you, let this bell ring out. Christ in you, the hope of all glory.